actually. Actually. Read it. I, they might be hearing the machine. My mic might pick up the. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's good. Okay. <laughs> okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Jill Felicio, and I am the Director of Advancement at Harvard's Division of Continuing Education. And on behalf of the Harvard Extension Alumni Association and its Midwest chapter, welcome to Name, Image, and Likeness, Monetization Opportunities and Beyond, the Changing Landscape of College Athletics with Professor Peter Carfagna. Now, as we get underway, I encourage you to use the chat box to say hello and reflect and place any questions that you wish to pose in the Q&A box. We have set aside time later in the hour to address your questions. And tonight's presentation is recorded, will be captioned, and then posted on Harvard Extension's YouTube channel. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our special guests for this evening. Professor Peter Carfagna is the chairman and CEO of Magis LLC, a privately owned sports marketing management and investment company in Minnesota. He has also been the managing member of LLCs affiliated with many major league baseball teams, including the Red Sox, Mariners, Astros, and Diamondbacks. Peter has previously served as chief legal uh -huh. counselor, uh, legal officer, excuse me, and general counsel of International Management Group. IMG, as a senior partner at Jones LLP, which is serving as an outside counsel to the Cleveland Browns and the Cleveland Cavaliers ownership groups. Now, Peter graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard College while playing varsity football. He went on to become a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and a graduate of Harvard Law School, where he studied under Professor Paul J. Weiler, the father of sports and law at Harvard. Now, at Harvard Law School, he is faculty advisor to the Harvard Law School's Committee on Sports and Entertainment Law and its Journal on Sports and Entertainment Law. He is also faculty supervisor of Harvard Law School's Sports Law Clinical Program. Peter has alternated teaching three sports law courses at Harvard Law School, each of which has been published as a casebook. He has taught representing the professional athlete, examining the legal evolution of America's three major leagues, and negotiating and drafting sports venue agreements. He has also taught sports law for non-lawyers at Harvard Extension School. And Peter is joined tonight by Aaron Caputo Esquire, who is the Executive Director of Legal and Client Services at the Superlative Group Incorporated in Cleveland, Ohio. Aaron is a graduate of Cleveland Marshall College of Law and received his master's in sports law at the University of Miami School of Law. Aaron currently serves as Professor Carfagna's research assistant extraordinaire at Magis mm -hmm. LLC and previously mm -hmm. served as a legal sports intern at Rock Nation Sports in New York legal extern for the Professional Collegiate League and legal intern for the Lake County Captains. He has also published The Bell Has Rung, Answering the Door for Student Athlete Concussion Issues in the National Collegiate Athletic Association in the Journal of Law and Health, and co-authored Improving the Game, the Football Players Health Study at Harvard University and the 2020 NFL, NFLPA Collective Bargaining Agreement with Harvard's Journal of Sports and Entertainment Law in 2021. Now, I am delighted to welcome you both. And with that, I turn the floor over to you, Peter. Thank you, Jill. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I think Jill just is frozen a little bit, but uh, if tech support tells me everything's over, uh, maybe just chats in and says, we're, we're good to go. You're back. No, you're not frozen. Okay, good to go. We're off to the races. Welcome, everybody. It's so great to be with you. I said in the prep session, I feel like I'm being welcomed home. I so enjoyed the time, uh, so enjoyed the time I, I spent teaching, uh, you know, sports law and non-lawyers at the Extension School. I, I remember it well, Elizabeth Raddatz, who's in the prep room, uh, one of the best students ever, and, and, and it's a real privilege. I'm really proud to be back, back home again, uh, you know, meeting with you all uh, here virtually through the internet. Uh, so Aaron is, is a colleague, a professional colleague for many, many years. He's helped me put this PowerPoint together. 
It comes out of our co-teaching uh, this mat material at Harvard and the University of Miami both, and, and it's evolving. It, it, what you're gonna see here uh, is, is gonna be uh, different a year from now, gonna be different uh, you know, two years from now, and, and it's evolved due to a lot of landmark cases, uh, and the most primary one being the Supreme Court's uh, recent decision in the Alston case, which we're gonna get into. Uh, but, but I guess I really wanna encourage chatting in, as Jill said, uh, because what we're talking about is perhaps the end of the student athlete as we have known, the student athlete. We're talking about the end of amateurism as we have known it. We're really on the verge of, of paying student athletes uh, to, to uh, play for your favorite university, whatever it might be. I saw somebody from Columbus chatted in, so we got a Buckeyes fan there, I'm sure. You know, I really, the, the question I would ask you to hold on to as an Ohio State Buckeyes fan is, would you keep cheering for them even if they were paid to play? We're not quite there. Uh, it's the, still a, perhaps legal restraint of trade to allow for name image likeness monetization uh, without allowing for uh, the head coach Ryan Day to pay his left tackle as much as it would take to get him to go there rather than Michigan, God forbid. Uh, but those are the kinds of things we're talking about, uh, both from a very legal and also a very practical standpoint. So um, Aaron is going to help me uh, scroll through our PowerPoint, help you without getting too heavily legalistic about <clears throat> what the Supreme Court has said and trying to get much more practical on, on what, what are the rules of the road? What is allowed now for student athletes? How is it different from pay to play? How is monetization of name image likeness different from uh, paying that left tackle, whatever it takes to go uh, to, you know, Ohio State versus Alabama? And, and, and what is gonna happen to the NCAA? What is gonna happen to March Madness? Is there, could, could there be secession? Could be, there be those schools who, uh, uh oh, the Dodgers, uh oh, this is the Dodgers. <laughs> Fan, okay, keep chatting in. And, and I want you to hang on to that question. It, it's throughout. Please do chat in as we go through this. You know, would you stop cheering for whatever your favorite school is if, if those student athletes were then paid to play uh, rather than just monetizing uh, for name members likeness? So, so that's a practical question. And, and, uh, and right now the answer is they cannot be paid to play, but uh, that, that's on the verge perhaps of the next case coming before the Supreme Court. Uh, the Alston case getting right on the verge of that. Uh, and name image likeness now being the monetization that really you, you'll see as we go through our presentation getting really, really close to paying the quarterback at Alabama. Got over a million dollars Bryce Young did uh, from boosters to attend Alabama, how that's not pay to play. Uh, you know, what does his center think? I wonder when he takes snaps from Bryce Young. <laughs> where's, where's my million dollars in boosterisms? Uh, but it wasn't an inducement, Aaron, uh, right? What, what are the guardrails here before we go to our scroll, scroll through our what are the guardrails? Why, why is that possible? Why is Bryce Young, he, he, he had a million dollars in endorsements, uh, public record before he, he took a snap at Alabama. How is that not pay to play? Yeah, thanks oh, for having you. Me. Yeah, great to have you. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. And I echo uh, Professor's comments about the uh, Harvard Extension School students. I TA'd for him there for a few years and always the best. Um, yeah, it, the, the short answer to your question, Professor Garfani, is that um, he wasn't paid by the university. There were third party endorsement deals. Um, so technically not pay for play because he was not paid by the university, but um, more NIL deals because he was paid by third parties to monetize his name, image, likeness and, you know, promote their products or, or their foundation or their association, whatever it may be. It wasn't an inducement to get him to go to Alabama. I hate to pick on Alabama. I hope there's no Alabama fans out there. And Nick Saban has done great things. You know, uh, he gets paid what nine, ten million a year. But uh, the university would say we've more than made up for that with improvement in uh, sort of the Flutie effect going all the way back to BC days. Uh, the high tide has risen a lot of boats in Alabama. But how, how is that not an inducement? I'm asking a, a sort of a rhetorical leading question, uh, Professor Caputo. How is that not an inducement to get Bryce Young to go to Alabama? Uh, that's the guardrail, right? Yeah, yeah, the, the two guardrails are, are right, you know, in, in legal inducement or, or recruiting, and then again, this this pay for play issue. And I guess, you know, the one is, he, you know, he's already there, so it wasn't, you know, inducement for him to come there, um, but maybe it's an inducement for him to stay there. Maybe it's not. Again, I think it all comes back to the fact that, you know, it's, I guess it, it is a third party, but again, still prohibitive of, of inducements, but um, because the fact he was, you know, already there and, and, you know, wasn't, you know, unlawfully or any way, um, you know, exploiting the, his name image likeness, doing it all by the book as, as it, um, you know, as it was, um, technically was not a, a, an inducement. And, and you can be sure, and now, now we will start to, to screen share some of these examples. Yeah, you can be sure uh, various states had laws, Alabama, I'm just, I don't mean to pick on them, 
that they are, you know, virtual national national champion up for it every year. You know, when it they're close to winning it, and 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 they build a wonderful, um, an amazing program. Uh, but they had all state law, right. and they rescinded it. They withdrew it because they didn't want to find anybody was a violation of it, right? So now right. it's basically uh, the athletic department. Uh, I don't want to say anything goes. I got to be careful what I say. There could be some Alabama fans, but I'm just using them as an example as we go go through what you'll see on the monetization. Some of the extreme examples of very close to pay to play, not quite pay to play, and and does that shatter the myth of amateurism that, that we all come if we're collegiate athlete fans as I am. Uh, you know, it, would that does that shatter my myth in, in Tommy Amaker and the Harvard basketball team if all of a sudden his best players were, were paid to attend Harvard. They can't be, of course, it's, it's not a full scholarship school, it's a financial aid school. But but you know, I, I, would I still cheer for Harvard football if, if all those kids were, were somehow uh, paid to play, or would, that, would I just go cheer for the Patriots? I mean, that, that's the dichotomy we're trying to set up here is, is amateurism a myth or is it a reality? Does it create a separate market, which is really what Supreme Court has said. So now with that background, uh, the, the pro-competitive reason for having a separate, not paid uh, athletic uh, con set of conferences, the NCAA, is it's pro-competitive. It creates a separate market. This is what the Supreme Court has said since 1984 in Board of Regents. And, and continued to say it through the Alston case, which came down last summer. So let's get a little legal here anyway, and, and take us through the, the uh, PowerPoint. And, uh, and you'll see, uh, follow the bouncing ball. We've got a, a, a few different headings, a few different subheadings. Uh, Aaron has helped me put this together. And, and, and you can see uh, right out of the gate, um, this intersection of, um, <clears throat> The Supreme Court, the Alston case came down last summer. The juxtaposition, pay for play. Then we're going to get to name, image, likeness. This is our table of contents. This is our setup. Then we're going to get to House versus NCAA. But, you know, it, it, it's really a, a retroactive. What about former student athletes? Um, oh, wait, we got a chat in. I, oh, I love the Harvard women's basketball team. Oh, gosh, that, that is my favorite. Their coach, their coach is my all time favorite, and she's retiring. Uh, Celia said, Celia, uh, I, I'm sorry, you won't have, uh, your daughter won't have the pleasure uh, of playing for a, the legend who's retiring this year, but I've been on panels with her and she's the best. Uh, anyway, uh, and then our student athletes employees already, by definition, the NLRB is suggesting yes in a memo that we're going to look at. And then should they be paid uh, at least minimum wage? That's the Johnson case we're going to look at. So again, so, so to sports law for non-lawyers, for the most part, there's probably some lawyers in the audience and that's, that's fine too. And we really do encourage the Q&A and the chatting in and the interactivity, uh, as Jill said at the beginning. So here, here's what we're talking about. This the Supreme Court case came down last summer. Um, and, and this is antitrust law, right? You're, you're illegally restraining these student athletes. You're, you're preventing them. You're, you're amazing. You're, you're preventing them from monetizing. If somebody was a, were a pianist, someone were an actor, an actress, uh, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, you can't uh, uh, participate in the school play uh, at XYZ University because you're making a million dollars over here at Hollywood. You know, there's just, there's no, there's no disconnect for the flautist who's, who's making a lot of money for the symphony and also plays in the school uh, symphony, you know, uh, but, but so is this an illegal restraint of athletes services is, is the abiding question. And at the federal court level, you know, goes district court, federal, uh, the federal appeals court, and then the uh, Supreme Court uh, said, basically what these are telling us, uh, Aaron, is, is yes, there must be this pro-competitive separate market of student athletes who are not paid to play, but you cannot cap expenses and benefits that are related to their education. So we're still talking about education, still talking about amateurism, still talking about uh, this separate market Supreme Court unanimously affirmed the Ninth Circuit's opinion uh, that any education-related expense cannot be capped. So as long as you can call it an education-related expense, the student athlete uh, or benefit, the student athlete remains eligible to participate for his or her uh, university. Uh, so the amateurism defense still lives on, but but is, is on life support, I think, Aaron, it's fair to, fair to say, because of just Judge Kavanaugh's concurrence, because he says, look, uh, this was an injunction case. You weren't, you really didn't have before us the pay to play issue. It was not brought to the court, it was in, and it, it withdrew it. Um, uh, but, you know, had it been before the court, 
indications in Judge Kavanaugh's very strong concurrence was it, that if, if it were to come before the court, he, he personally would find it to be an illegal restraint of trade uh, to say they can't be paid a market rate to go play their sport at XYZ University. Is that a fair summary, Aaron, you think? Yeah, the... yeah, I'd say, yeah, to, to boil it down into its simple, simplest terms, if we talk about an antitrust case, the, um, the, the players, you know, the plaintiffs show that, you know, their economic rights were capped at zero and that they weren't allowed to, um, you know, receive any sort of, you know, educational expenses above cost of attendance um, in this case, which is, um, you know, what they claimed. They, they proved that, the NCAA proved there was a pro-competitive a pro effect of them establishing, you know, this amateurism market or maintaining this amateurism market. And then the plaintiff showed that there was um, a less restrictive alternative, um, which, you know, gets them over the hump here and that um, there should be no cap there on education related expenses. Again, um, maintaining that, that amateurism defense, at least here, and that that would um, maintain that, that amateur market um, that, that the NCAA is trying to promote. Um, but again, to your point, Professor Arfani, it was, it was a 9-0 decision. Um, however, uh, Judge Kavanaugh's concurrence is, is what everyone leans on, which is a lot of, what a lot of people took away from this is that, you know, he says the NCAA is subject to, to rule of recent scrutiny, which is the, the three, three ish steps that I just went through. Um, and, you know, the, the one line that everyone hangs on to is, is the NCAA is not above the law. And so he is kind of challenging, um, you know, or, or asking for another challenge to come, uh, you know, essentially stating that, you know, what was decided here is not the limit as to, uh, you know, the NCAA's violation of antitrust law there. Yes. Bring back the rest of your rules and when we'll see how they, how they fall under the rule of reason scrutiny analysis. There's still a, a, a book of rules that would choke a horse and it's yeah. still out there and there's still right. all sorts of uh, rules that could render somebody ineligible and, and uh, you know, look out, here we come. Uh, but, okay, next, so what happens when this comes down? What happens when this comes down is they were basically going to file uh, the NCAA's general counsel then left soon after this, to be quite honest. Uh, uh, you know, NIL comes down the other side. Now they were going to try to enjoin uh, name, image, likeness, monetization because athletics reputation rule that otherwise had been in existence uh, before, you know, individual states had passed all this legislation leading up to uh, it was going to, the effective date would be July uh, 1. Uh, NCAA was going to aggregate all those cases in one federal court and say, no, you know, no, no, you can't do this. It, it would destroy amateurism. And, uh, you know, in order to prevent this imbalance, the NCAA adopted a uniform interim policy, in other words, caved, right? Saying we will no longer, we, we will no longer enforce name, image, likeness rules, which in the past, I mean, micro, micro, anybody had benefited <clears throat> to make $1 off their athletics reputation uh, was declared, well, not $1, there's like a $100 safe haven. Uh, anybody who made any, any sort of money was declared it now ineligible immediately upon receiving any compensation for uh, branding his or her athletics or reputation. So, so th this kind of went by the boards, the, the, the most extreme of the NCAA uh, ineligibility rules, uh, essentially it, they defaulted to say, uh, you know, each conference and, and each school within each conference uh, will, will have its, uh, its own NIL policy. And as we said, there's only very limited uh, guardrails uh, that were left in place. And Aaron and I were saying in the prep session, there's not been one a case of ineligibility brought. And, and wait till you see some of these examples of NIL that we're going to share with you. <clears throat> and you, you make the call, uh, determine whether or not they really don't uh, cross the border into pay to play. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so so. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. this interim policy. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would just clarify one thing too, just to, to make sure it's clear is that the NIL issue and then what was it, the issue that was in um, Olson versus NCAA, the, the kind of the pay for play issue, they, they were two separate things. They just kind of came to a head at the same time. I know it can get kind of confusing when you see these two come up. A lot of people think they're related and they're um, somewhat, but, but not the same issue, right? It was this um, state legislation, NIL legislation that Professor Garfani mentioned was um, a lot of these laws were supposed to be, um, you know, they were enacted and were gonna be, become into effect on July 1st, 2021. Um, the oral arguments for Alston were heard in March of 2021 and, or sorry, um, October. And then the decision was rendered in June of 2021. So it was, you know, June of 2020, 20, uh, 2021, Alston is, um, the decision in Alston is rendered in, you know, July 1st, 2021 is when all these laws are going to go into effect. So the NCAA re repeals its name, image, likeness policy on June 30th, 2021. So they're, they're two separate issues. I just want to make sure that that was clear. And then so now we'll go into how the world of 
of NIL is kind of developed after July 1st, 2021. Right, and pay to play is still hanging out there, waiting. Judge Kavanaugh's waiting for it right. to come back as being an illegal restraint of trade. Uh, but thank you for that. Uh, and and uh, individuals can engage. Here it is. You know, go ahead. Uh, consistent with the law of the state. Well, that's why Alabama took its state law down. They don't yeah. want anybody in violation. Of it. Colleges and universities may be a resource, but again, they can't really. Uh, say yes or no to a marketing deal. They shouldn't. You'll see that when we get into some of the specific policies. Athletes who attend a school in the state without a law, look, uh, you know, uh, basically it's, it's, it's up to the conference, it's up to the school, uh, the only guardrail. Uh, and you, you can and probably should use a professional service provider, but you have to pay market rate or else you're getting extra benefit, which would still be a violation. Next bullet point, yes, you know, the clearinghouse at Harvard and everywhere else is to go through uh, the athletic department, which has to not so much say yay or nay to the deal, but say whether it's within these guardrails of an inducement uh, either to attend or, or to stay in, in attendance can't be improper recruiting, cannot be paid for performance, paid for play. So that, that guardrail, those are the only two guardrails. Uh, in other words, touchdown, $10,000, no. Uh, come here, $50,000, no. But, but you'll see this appears to now be observed in the breach again. As Aaron has pointed out, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind, for the boosters to come to the university and say, but really not involving the university at all, just saying, we will pay Bryce Young. I'm just going to say with a million dollars because we want his brand. And, and it could, you know, it could well be worth it. It could be well, well be worth it to have him endorse on social media and post and say, hey, I like XYZ product. Uh, and then he goes and he, he goes and wins it. The Heisman Trophy and, and, and the teams in the national championship game uh, two, three years in a row. You know, so 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 the, the colleges are not going to be in the business of saying no. You're paying too much, right? That, that's not their job. Uh, and yet, uh, at the same time, uh, th this whole issue of inducement to come to the school and proper recruiting and to be paid more for the better you play—that's the other guardrail. Is really, you'll see with some of these examples, uh, right at the at the tip of pay to play. Yeah. Okay. That's the point I would reiterate. Yeah. Is that the, the yeah. line is, is kind of getting blurred. There is no black and white. A lot of times when you're talking about NIL and then improper recruiting versus versus pay for, pay for play, the, the line can get blurred there as you'll see through some of these examples. Um, you know, it, it's, a little, it's a little bit more blurred than I think people thought it would be when you know, you're thinking about it in a theoretical sense. So just- Yeah, and, and, and you make the call, Real, do chat in, tell us, you know the guardrails now, you know this as well as we. Yeah, you know, the, the, the idea that the only thing that's left for amateurism is there should be a separate market uh, where there are student athletes who are enrolled in an institution and who are not paid to attend that institution. Uh, that's really all that's left. Is that really, is that a myth or, or a reality? Is that, is that pro-competitive reason for otherwise illegally restraining the trade of the next great quarterback? Is that, you know, should that, you know, if you were the, you were on the Supreme Court, if you were Judge Kavanaugh, came before you, how, how would you rule? Is that an illegal restraint of trade? Uh, but anyway, we'll go through it and, and we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I would say that's kind of the ultimate question here that we're talking about, Professor Garfani, is that, you know, we've heard the the pro-competitive effect of establishing an, an, an amateur market is, is pretty well established. It's been, you know, yep. cited and, and uh, you know, discussed and agreed upon in, in multiple cases. You're talking about O'Bannon, Alston, you know, Board of Regents, it was dicta, but um, it's kind of, it's came all the way through through all those cases. The the ultimate question is what actually does that mean? What What is at the core of that amateur market? And like what you're saying, Professor Garifani, is it, is it just simply enrollment in the school? Is it just playing for the school? Is that what ultimately creates the, the fandom and the allegiance to um, those players and those teams? Um, and if that's it, then you know, again, I think pay for play would, would be an illegal restraint of trade. But again, I think there's a lot more nuance to it. But at the core, it's, you know, what creates and justifies that amateur market? What, what makes you coming back for more? What, what defines the amateur market? Yeah, and I'd love for people to chat in what their, yeah. uh, you know, what their favorite school is and keep asking that question. You know, we could do a, I saw Notre Dame in there in the chat room. I'm Notre Dame by marriage. And, I mean, that, that is a religious thing. I am not, and I know, I mean, uh, live and die with every, and, and Brian Kelly leaves 10 million reasons why he leaves. And, uh, you know, that's the other thing. Who, who, 
who gets paid here, the coaches? Who, where does all this money go? Because this is a multi-billion dollar proposition. We're talking about NCAA uh, media rights and the big five power conferences are multi-million dollar propositions. Texas has its own Longhorn network. And, and, you know, the facilities, the arms race for facilities, that's where the millions go. Uh, and, uh, and the players get the full cost of attendance at a scholarship school, plus any benefits that, that can be attenuated as they may be that somehow are related to an education related benefit. So whatever that ends up being full cost of attendance, tuition, room board, full cost of attendance, plus any education related benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe it's pick University of Miami, it's 60,000 plus another 10, if you want to stretch it, Aaron, 12,000, really. uh, But they're still, uh, you know, not. And then and then on top of it, you have an IL. So pretty soon, uh, you know, playing at the University of Miami for the Hurricanes is starting to look pretty good. But but as I said, as we'll see when we go into it, uh, these schools, you know, get these kids come for NIL opportunities like Florida now allows. In, in, in the use of NIL allows their student athletes to use Florida's name, image, likeness, their intellectual property, University of Florida Gators. And, and Miami says, no, we're not going to allow uh, our student athletes for a lot of good reasons to use uh, the Hurricanes uh, intellectual property in monetizing their NIL. And, and that's one of the big differences among and between the various schools. And, and it's really hurting Miami in the recruitment process because kids are saying, hey, there it is two years ago. There you go. All right. All right. There you go. Uh, I want uh, proud Gator. Okay, right. So you're you're winning. You're winning. Uh, you're beating Miami on the recruitment front. But, they, <laughs> but by the way, by the way, Kevin. Um, oh, Duke's man. All right, <laughs> all right, Coach K. That was a great celebration of Coach K. Uh, the other night. It's too bad they lost. Uh, so Kyle Draster is he's making no money. Very upsetting. There you go. Thank you. We've had, we're getting some good audience reaction. Thank you. Uh, but, but this, this, is, this is where the game is being played now is, is you know, there's, an, there's a Razorback. Hey, you had a good football season. Way to go. All right. That's awesome. And I, like your, I really like your coach. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, so conference policies, individual school policies, uh, 28 states have NIL. Now let's get into some. And you guys, now that we have some interaction going, let's, let's really look at hard at some of these and see if, 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 if the Gators did this, would you be okay with it? Would you still cheer for the Gators? If, you know, what the Razorbacks did this, would that be okay with you? Um, oh, the Ivy League, Kevin. Okay, there you go. There you go. There's the interactivity we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, or, or would you become a Dolphins fan, Kevin? I mean, that's the question. No, I don't think so. Or a Jacksonville Jaguars fan? No, heck no. No. I mean, that's why this, this whole thing is a myth. So anyway, Ivy League, Harvard, D.C., we use those as examples. D.C. has one of the highest graduation rates. Notre Dame, Stanford, uh, they are, and we're juxtaposing these because, as I said before, in the Ivy League, uh, there are no scholarships. Uh, there are no athletic scholarships. They are all based on financial need, right? So uh, uh, you could argue they need, in order to level the playing field with a kid over at Boston College, and I am more than a kid at BC does. BC has a wonderful program. Uh, we liaise with them when I'm at Harvard. They, they do. They do uh, the most they can to keep things in the guardrails. They have a program called SOAR, S-O-A-R, that's just terrific. If we had more time, we could take you through at Harvard's. I was on the committee that drafted the Harvard policy. It's, it's right down the middle. Everything has to come through. Uh, the athletic department, again, uh, very careful about, uh, you should have your own professional advisor. You should have actually, uh, you should have essentially a brand manager is telling you whether or not to do these things. Be really careful because you can't interfere with practice time. You can't agree to do stuff that'll get in, in the way of your participation in the team, even, even at Harvard. Certainly that's across the board. You know, uh, we're not going to opine on whether it's a good, bad, or in, in a different deal as we approve it, as long as we see it's not an inducement and not paying you to participate. Uh, you know, we're going to approve it, but you should have your own professional advisors advise on the tax consequences of, the, of this. Uh, and, and you have to pay them. You have to pay them market rate uh, and, and be careful what you sign and make sure it, it extinguishes when you are no longer a student athlete. You don't want to be giving away your, your name, image, likeness rights forever. Uh, it, it, it expires when your athletic eligibility expires. And, and don't please don't overcommit. We need to bring to your attention. These are the kinds of things that are in all these policies, especially at Harvard. Look, given, given the demands on you as a student athlete at a place like Harvard or BC, make sure you're not committing to too many appearances. Make sure, and, and in Harvard's case, you, you cannot wear the Harvard Crimson. You know, you just can't. I mean, it's just too valuable and no property. Uh, 
to my, to allow the student athletes to modernize, but make sure you're not making too many commitments, too many personal appearances. You're not saying, and, and, and there are certain categories. You can't interfere with whatever the university, whatever, if it's an Adidas university, you can't do not Adidas. You know, you've got, you can't ambush the university by name, you know, getting involved with other, you know, a competing company. You can't have drugs, alcohol, uh, casinos, gambling, you know, there's certain prohibited categories uh, across the board at the schools that do it right. And, and, uh, and I'm proud to say we've looked closely at these, Aaron and I have, and, uh, you know, Dartmouth is probably the most aggressive and they've been <laughs> very successful. And uh, Yale's football coach would happily said when this came down, the more NIL, the better. Tony Reno, <laughs> what, a, what a guy. And uh, anyway, Harvard's been very sort of quiet about it and, and, and subtle and nuanced as, as Harvard always is. And I'm proud to have been part of that uh, program. Uh, okay, so let's get into some of these examples and please do chat in. Um, yeah, so I mean, here we go, right out of the gate. Okay, now, now Aaron, I'll ask you the provocative question. These Fresno State women's basketball team members, Fresno State's not exactly synonymous, no offense with UCLA, but they had a huge series of national deals right on the first possible day. Mikey Williams, just going to skip over Miami for a second. High school, Excel Sports, he's got over a million dollars in NIL. He's still in high school, uh, and that would not render him ineligible for, for college. But, but you know, what is it that's consistent? Why is it that Mikey has a million dollars in Excel Sports is represent him only for marketing? You cannot have an agent to represent you for, towards NB, his NBA career. W yeah. What is it about, about these? It's the social media presence for, for these student athletes or, or, you know, potential student athletes, right? It's, it's the amount of I, but what would, you know, what drives a lot of these deals is, is again, the eyeballs that you can get um, onto your brand if you're a brand that's promoting one of these um, student athletes. So again, perfect way to do that is through social media. It's Twitter, it's Instagram, it's TikTok. You know, Mikey Williams had, I think, 2 million followers on Instagram, right? I think that's, you know, incredible yes. value. You know, a, a social media presence like that is incredibly value to monetize. So um, that's where you see a, a lot of these big deals coming in is, again, it's it's students that, you know, have a, a, a huge social media presence. And again, you see, you know, at the top, again, you're talking about a Bryce Young or, you know, another top college quarterback. They have a lot of, you know, social media presence and, and just notoriety because they're on TV all the time too. And they're playing every Saturday in a primetime game. It, it, it's all about, you know, notoriety. And a lot of that comes through social media presence, but that's a lot of the driver behind, um, behind these deals. It's, it's not just social media, I guess it's media in general, media presence that, again, can, can attract eyeballs and, and generate a lot of revenue. And this Mikey Williams is the next LeBron. That's why I skipped over Miami. We do have a Gators fan, so yeah, you're not going to like this one, uh, Kevin. But, you know, all 90 scholarship play. Oh, just say my fitness center, okay. my MMA gym. Okay. Oh, just, you know, oh, just come here when you can. You know, 3.4 million in TikTok. Oh, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That is amazing. So, hey, you could help teach this. Yeah, yeah. You want to come on this side of the camera? That's pretty good. <laughs> that's really good. You know, so Mikey Williams, you know, he can get whatever he wants because Excel. But see, Celia, uh, now Excel, my good friends at Excel, they're with me at IMG. They, they, they're back to recruiting in the high school gyms again because, he's, you know, they, these kids almost don't need high school. I'm going off uh, course just a little bit. Uh, they, they don't need college. They, they play for the AAU team. They, they play for the academy team. You know, all that stuff. And it's all about social media presence because they can monetize it now. But you still cannot have an agent or you'd be declared an agent who will represent you vis-a-vis -vis the NBA. So Jeff Schwartz, who runs Excel, used to work with me at IMG. He, he's taking Mikey Williams on the IFCOM. Their marketing department is representing him for marketing only. You got to be so careful because if that turns the corner and they represent him vis-a-vis -vis his negotiation, even when he's eligible to enter the NBA, that, then he's, he's ineligible. So, so that's one of the, but, but the, it, for the Florida Gator fan, Kevin, I think it was, the 90 scholarship players, all of them get $500 uh, per month, right? To, to promote the gyms, social media, personal appearances, query. I, I don't even want to comment on that one. Uh, I like the college hunks hauling junk moving company, the whole San Diego State team and BYU, this is really at the extreme. Even the walk-ons, you know, as well as the walk-on, for those of you who don't know, those who are like Rudy, you know, the practice players who aren't on scholarship, uh, even those uh, all 20, 100, 23, 123 members, uh, as well as the full tuition, uh, have an NAL agreement with Build Brands, um, compensation going to everybody who walks on uh, to the practice field even for BYU. So, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Well, the yeah. one thing I'd say, Prescott, I think it's important to emphasize again, you, you just touched on it with 
the Mikey Williams example is that there's still all these other, you know, NIL or NCAA rules that are still in effect that, you know, survived that weren't touched by any, you know, NIL or, or weren't touched by Austin that, that are still in the background or, and are still effective. So again, you're talking about the no agent rule or impermissible benefit rules. Like if, if you're, you know, an agent, you're working with, with some of these students, you still have to be cognizant of all of those, because again, one slip up and you may render someone ineligible, um, you have to be very knowledgeable in the area. Um, but again, all those still still survive. It's just the NIL rule that was suspended until, you know, something was figured out. And then that's when, you know, the state laws were, were implemented and, and then conferences and schools started developing their policies. But um, again, there's a lot of other rules that still survive. Yeah, and, and compliance departments. We just did a, <laughs> a webinar with the University of Miami Compliance Department. I mean, it had never been busier in, in clearing these deals or not, you know, I mean, and, and again, they can't opine uh, and, and say it's not a good deal. They just have to put it up against on a template basis and say, you have to go get professional help on this. So we strongly recommend that you do. Uh, this is really close to the line. We can't stop it, but it doesn't look like a very good deal. And when you go to get a lawyer, a tax advisor, a financial planner, uh, right, right, you have to pay market rate or else you're getting an extra benefit as an athlete. And, and you'd be declared ineligible. So Aaron makes the very good point that the extra benefits rule still very much applies. Okay, um, well, here's some more. Yeah, again, Tennessee State's not, you know, but for he, Hersey Miller having that kind of presence, he doesn't get $2 million. This is one back home, the person from Ohio State, this is a killer for us, right? Million dollars from NIL deals to bring him to Columbus. He didn't play his senior year at the University of Texas high school ball. He's, the best quarterback in Texas. So, so they thought, and, and he came and he didn't get on the field hardly at all, maybe once, Aaron. Uh, and he did, yeah, he did secure a million dollars in any LDLs. And guess what? He's not going to play next year. He got beaten out and he's going back uh, <laughs> to the University of Texas, right? Here's one of the edgy ones, right? The beer company, again, is that an alcohol category? I mean, and, and, and then these, these are kind of the, gee, the marketers have to be wondering, did they make the right choice? Because here's three quarterbacks who either got hurt, didn't play well, or got benched, right? And, and go ahead, Aaron. So, so can they suspend payment when Rattler gets benched? Can they suspend oh. payment? Derek King gets hurt. Right, unless there was, you know, I guess a violation on the front end of the clauses that could be included in the agreement again, because it can't be any sort of inducement or tied to, to on-field play like that. So. Um, again, it's, you know, at this point, you kind of have to, to, to eat the investment and maybe they were, they recouped it. Maybe they, they got the ROI back, um, just from the initial announcement of it. But again, no, can't do that. Yeah. And, and again, maybe they're hoping when he turns pro, uh, you know, if it's a marketing agency, uh, they'll, they'll get him for the representation when he turns pro. Uh, okay. We've got some other examples. This, this is one, I think this. I keep picking on the Longhorns. It's probably closest to the line. Uh, <clears throat> very sketchy, very, as Aaron said, gray. <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, the pancake factory because they put people on their backs with pancake blocks. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, every Texas uh, Longhorns Office of Lyman will receive $50,000 annually to support, in quotes, charitable causes. Unclear, a very unclear. It's, I think it's one of those that's being investigated. Um, you know, uh, again, a lot of money too. Yeah, that's a lot of money yeah. for a right guard, a left guard. It really gets back to what would you pay that, you know, that blindside uh, tackle to protect your quarterback. Um, I think again, it yeah, sheds a little bit more light on. I think in this article it says I think Texas has had like two offensive linemen drafted in the first two rounds in the past five years or so. So is this a way to get? you know, more talented offensive linemen to the University of Texas. Like it, this one, I, I wouldn't say it, it's clear, but it's it's very suspicious and <laughs> in the way absolutely. that it's framed, right? A absolutely. No, their new head coach said, we got to keep our quarterback, you know, uh, standing. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, some of these will be investigated. The NCAA is really leaving it to the conferences and the schools, as we said, but <clears throat> and as we said before, the symbol and logo use in conjunction, some schools, yes, other schools, no. Um, and then this aggregate UNC has put together this sort of collective West Virginia, Oliver Luck, a good friend, former eight athletic director there has come back to say, well, we will, we will make this easier for you. We will create a group licensing for West Virginia. And we're over here and the athletic departments over there. And we're dealing with 
uh, boosters. So the school's not paying them. These are boosters who want to be branded by the athletes. Now, uh, again, they, they're avoiding university as recruiter, right? Because uh, Oliver and then UNC as a group <clears throat> uh, sort of marketing effort for uh, anybody who wants to be in it. Um, <clears throat> you know, what about Title IX? Does that disfavor the female, the women sports? Well, it's really not the school engaging in substantial disproportionality so as to violate Title IX <clears throat> because these are boosters saying, I want to support you know, this program or this student in this program. And, and the university is, is standing by watching this happen, but they're not paying the player, which is kind of the issue we get, keep getting back to, but university as recruiter. And there are many ultimates, there's many third party providers, uh, which this school can pay for and student athletes can get to know and, and understand and appreciate all of the nuances. Uh, you know, companies have sprung up like weeds to say 98 strong is another one that is, is represented in quotes for marketing a lot of Ivy League uh, players for collective deals. You know, hey, I have the whole water polo team. You know, uh, what will you pay XYZ brand? And, and there's even brand side that goes fishing for collectives like that too. Uh, so, so this is a whole market that has developed now. And, and the question is, <clears throat> and Aaron, I'll ask this again, hypothetical. Is there, does it have to be some sort of market rate? The Texas Longhorns thing certainly wouldn't seem to meet that. It can't be that a market would pay each lineman, that sort of thing. But, but the, the implication in everything that we've seen and heard and studied is that it should bear some resemblance to a return on investment for the sponsor or, or, or else you, you, you know it's got to be it, it just doesn't smell right yeah you're getting yeah i think that's what you know you, you kind of get into the again into the gray area and you're starting to it gets suspicious scratching your head when you see things that right maybe don't look like market rate or or we talked about a little bit in the prep session if you're not seeing you know the output the return the exchange for your investment when you're and, and maybe that's intentional right if, if you pay you know x athlete to promote your product um, you know, and, and they promote it maybe once or twice, they're maintaining some, or they're satisfying some obligation under the agreement, but, you know, it, it's really just a way to, to pay them, you know, for, for their name and likeness, again, whether it is an, an improper inducement or, or something like that, or pseudo pay to play, um, it does, it does kind of get, you know, a little bit head scratching in, in that, you know, it, it doesn't look like what you'd see in standard market rate, if you, even if you compared it to, um, you know, a professional athlete or the professional athlete market. Obviously, they have a lot more notoriety and things like that. Um, but uh, the numbers don't necessarily always seem to be comparable, which can, can again, seem a bit suspicious. Yeah, and it, it would still be up to, say, the athletic department at Texas to blow the whistle on that. And are they really going to do that? Because they really need an offensive line, you know, I mean, to, to get back in, in sort of the national competition. So, uh, you know, is, is it the foxes guarding the hen houses? That, that's sort of the question. Um, right. And that, you know, no attorney general is right. going to come in and say, yeah. you know, hey, <laughs> wait a minute, the, 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 law, the, the law, law said this, yeah. and, and, and the quarterback's not going to play because he, he he broke the NIL law. I mean, I don't think that's <laughs> yeah. going to happen. Uh, yeah. So it, it is, it is, uh, it, it is really. Uh, the Wild West. We did a seminar at Harvard uh, Law <clears throat> with Jeff Schwartz again, the NBA at recruiting. Well, I can't call it NBA recruiting, recruiting the Mikey Williamsons of the world. He said, w w it is the Wild West anymore. We've got to find the kid in the high school gym anymore and hope we can do good marketing for him and hope we get him to sign the next LeBron. And they know who they are. I mean, they know, yeah. you know those of you who follow, I mean, the pre-professional uh, uh, market, you know, IMG's academies, which we started when I was still there, all the different academies, you know, I mean, these are pre-professional programs. Uh, kids don't even play for their high school team oftentimes anymore. They go, you know, to, to the, the regional hockey team, the regional, uh, the Silver Dolphins instead of the high school swim team. It's kind of a sad thing to see. And, and we should add, <laughs> in certain states, New York has allowed NIL for high school athletes. So, you know, again, to be competitive uh, because kids, you know, are going to go where they can <clears throat> perhaps monetize or not. New Jersey, cross the state line when I play for an academy school in New York where I can monetize. You know what I mean? So that that's the next arms race I think we're going to see is high school yeah. NIL, which is really uh, going to be unfortunate. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this is the next big 
uh, lawsuit that we're following. So because NIL had not been allowed, uh, a statute of limitations allowed these plaintiffs to go far back as 2016. So House is saying, wait a minute, what about me, Grant House, Sedona Prince, Tamir Oliver, wait a minute, <laughs> I couldn't do this, <laughs> right? And all you guys at the Power Five conferences, you're all violated, there's section one of the Sherman Act, because we weren't allowed to monetize any of likeness, we're going as far back as statute of limitations let us, and, and we want an injunction uh, that says it should be free, and, 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 and more importantly, we want damages to, to current, uh, well, and former, these are former student athletes for the most part, that were unable. Right, and, and how about, they're also seeking media revenues. And I, I do not think, I think the, the consideration of getting a full cost of attendance of scholarship does include uh, the forfeiture of your media rights. You're not gonna get 50% unless you create an association or a union to negotiate it. You're just not gonna get a piece that's of the media cool. right. That, 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 that's O'Bannon rolled that, yes, thanks Aaron. So, you know, but uh, it's set for a jury trial and, and watch that space. Again, it could be a settlement of a class action. Uh, where everybody gets that that an expert will come in and say this that or the other former student athlete could have would have should have received it's sort of like the video games settled anybody who's one of us ncaa video games and the abandon settlement got paid uh, a market rate for that which uh, was then determined uh would have been uh that fair value for them to have been placed into those video games without their permission without their consent okay we're getting close i know jill you're going to want to leave room for questions but please do uh uh, you know, and here, here's what he said we'd talk about, so we will. Jennifer Abruzzo has stated as far as she's concerned under the National Labor Relations Act, uh, she as general counsel has, say, has said they are performing services in return for compensation. That would be full cost of tenants plus any educational related benefit. And uh, broad language, section two point, section, subsection three of the act. <laughs> and common law indicators fully support the conclusion that they are statutory employees, they have the right to act collectively to improve. So here comes the NCPA, not the MLBPA, which is settled today, thank God, uh, the lockout, uh, filed an unfair labor practice charge saying, hey, wait a minute, we're employees, you, you know, we're entitled to be treated like employees, we're entitled to the bargaining table. Uh, and because you won't acknowledge us, uh, because you will not acknowledge us as an association representative, you are engaged in an unfair labor practice. And, and that's where media rights could come into play. Because uh, you could say, look, uh, in medical benefits, increased medical benefits. Cory Be Booker had a, had a really good possible federal legislation. He played football at Stanford. And you know that's the kind of thing that, that an association, uh, not, not so much even a union, but an association could bargain on behalf of uh, employees. Of course, then, You've got tax considerations uh, if you're an employee and it's not cost of attendance plus education related benefits so that that raise and then you've you also got all sorts of title IX uh, implications as well as soon as you'd have to negotiate in a substantially proportional way on behalf of the women's varsity teams and uh, not just the men uh, okay and then um, i think our last slide right are they employees are they entitled to Fair Labor Standards Act, minimum wage. Here comes Trey Johnson, five other current and former athletes. Doggone it, um, you know, we should be like grad assistants who get paid so much per hour. Uh, you know, we, we, you know uh, we, we should at least get minimum wage. We should at least get minimum wage because we are uh, just like the people who work in the dining hall or <laughs> clean the uh, clean the dorm rooms, right? We should at least get minimum wage because we are employees entitled to at least uh, wage and overtime uh, money. Uh, now this has been tried before and failed, but in this case, Judge Padova has ruled, uh, no, I, I think they've got something worth looking at. And it was uh, allowed to go to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals on what's called an interlocutory appeal. That's an emergency appeal. It's now pending. And that certainly would very much upset the apple cart if, uh, again, universities had to, had to pay at least minimum wage and overtime uh, because uh, their student athletes were treated, uh, in fact, as, as employees under the FLSA. So, uh, okay. And Jill, you had asked us to leave uh, 15 minutes for questions. We got 10. I hope you don't mind that we went over a little bit, but uh, Happy to take a step back and- uh, No, and goodness, no. I mean, really, this is such interesting information and so nuanced and fascinating. I mean, the implications are just massive. 
So thank you for that on behalf of our attendees. It's just such an interesting topic. Um, I want to just start with Kevin's reflection in chat. Great question. If they are receiving compensation with an estimated or established value of tuition, then isn't this compensation really mean that they're professional? I mean, is there any line of demarcation there? It's a really good question. That's kind of, <clears throat> you know, the million dollar question that Bryce Wong, Bryce Young, you know, certainly is going to have to be paying taxes on the million dollars that the boosters paid him, uh, you know, for his branding, uh, ex, you know, while he's ex, his exploits on the field for the University of Alabama. I, 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 this is angels dancing on the head of a pin, Joe. It really is. I mean, it, it's it's terror incognita. Nobody's been here before. The NCAA is so scared by all these rulings that have gone against them. Uh, they're on the precipice of losing pay to play if it's brought back before the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, it's like death by a thousand cuts, the NCAA, and almost like flip it around and say, and say, like, what is left of the NCAA? Uh, really, conference autonomy is the rule of the day. These power five conferences, even the Ivy League has its own media rights deal. You know, I mean, so, so what is left of the NCAA? What, what, you know, is that the last all they had was March Madness, which is over a billion dollars in media rights. Media rights is what drives all this, right? I mean, across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so I guess the question becomes: let, Let's let's look at it in the real world. Probably they should get a, a participation in in the media rights. There's no without the student athlete, and does that make them an employee? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, honestly, or is the full cost of attendance plus education related benefits sufficient consideration for them to drive? multi-million dollar March Mad multi-billion dollar March Madness deals, multi-million dollar media rights deals for the SEC and the Power Five conferences. It's, you know, it, it, let's see, let's see, we got a couple of chats. Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, great. Kevin, Kevin, <laughs> a receiving a comes of value too. There's an it comes there's an they've always been professional. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. And, oh, we become, we become like the minor leagues. That's the case. Yes, yes, it should always have been minor leagues. They're in Ireland, it should have always been minor leagues. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Go ahead, Aaron. You handle I was going to say, yeah. Kevin, I think the first point you made is, you know, receiving compensation with an established value of tuition. Is that not compensation? It's like, I mean, that's the argument that the, the players made in the mm -hmm. uh, in the Northwestern challenge, you know, under the NLR right. in 20, I think it was, was it 14 or 16 around then when, you know, essentially challenging challenging to become uh, to be determined as employees under the National Labor Relations Act. And that's essentially the argument they made. And that case was ultimately punted and that they didn't decide based on, you know, public versus state or private institutions and, and other issues. But that was, you know, essentially what they said. And it was a, a good argument, in my opinion. And I, again, I think it, it is more of that, the, the slippery slope argument that, you know, we've been talking about. It's like, that counts as compensation, then you, you throw on, you know, cost of, full cost of attendance, then costs, um, you know, related to education is, you know, getting some form of compensation there. And then we talk about NIL, and we talk about like all these are keep chipping away at this amateurism defense. Like, again, they can receive, you know, now up to, you know, again, talking about NIL incorporated Bryce Young, a million dollars, you know, this year. Um, and, and for some reason, I don't see how that would, you know, how the amateur amateurism defense or the justification to that withstands, um, you know, some of these different compensation methods and, and really how, how is that creating a separate, separate amateurism market from a pro market? If you're talking about receiving forms of, of compensation that makes someone a professional um, it's, it is again, as Professor Garfani mentioned, it's angels dancing on the head of a pin. It's very difficult to distinguish and it, it, it makes the, the NCAA's argument, uh, amateurism argument much less justifiable in my opinion. And and Jill, here here is the like the final exam question. Uh, so you're taking my class again. I think Nick is in the audience, and and uh, Elizabeth. So it's great to be back to teaching and, and, and <laughs> interacting with you again. But uh, but like conference autonomy, right? The Supreme Court talks a lot about a, a conference autonomy. So it, 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 you could justify the SEC saying we will get together. We will not collude with any of the other Power Five conferences. Uh, mm -hmm. ACC can do whatever it wants to do. Uh, and, and we will agree, we're gonna put a cap on how much we pay the incoming football and basketball class. And we'll do it substantially proportional across all of our varsity sports. Uh, but we're not gonna pay them like, you know, an unlimited amount. We're gonna put a cap in it to preserve amateurism so, so that they are not like, you know, uh, the Dallas Cowboys. They are not like uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars. They, they are still capped and, and they're still legally restraining their trade. 
they're now being paid to play, you know, but they're only being paid a certain amount. And as long as the conferences would not collude, that that might that might pass rule of reason scrutiny. It might, you know, and then the ultimate question uh, is being a less restrictive alternative, you know, to to not being paid at all. So that's that's what we put out in our final exam for our students. Something to think about. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah go ahead, Eric. Bruce Garfani on the the conference piece. Um, I guess again, we kind of we briefly touched on um, the steps of an antitrust analysis, but. Uh, the pro-competitive justification is, is that second step that we've been talking about. But in, in that scenario, it may not even get to that step two if they're if the conferences don't have you know enough share of the market to actually have an anti-competitive right. market. So you know, they may fail at step one, or the NCAA may succeed at step one. I guess is a different way of framing it. So where you know that's that's essentially the end of it. You don't even have to get to the amateurism defense at that point as a pro-competitive justification. Yeah, yeah. And then our, our final question for the audience would be. <clears throat> And you know uh, Ben Simmons. If anybody's a, a fan, there's a great thirty for thirty on, on you know uh, the recruiting of Ben Simmons. And now, oh gosh, Clutch and Rich Paul retired his his stepsister. And yeah, I, I want to get into all the recruiting that went into Ben Simmons. But the thirty for thirty was all he had to do was maintain in the second semester a two point as he was playing for LSU, and he went there for all sorts of interesting reasons, um, which I don't want to get into, but. <laughs> You know, is de, is de facto and de jure, as we say in the law, is de facto and de jure enrollment mm -hmm. as a student athlete, even though he, he didn't go to a class and he flunked out his, his, his uh, second semester, he's playing in the NCAA, and this, this, he's not the only one, I'm just picking on him because it was a 30 for 30, is that sufficient to establish the separate market? Is that mm -hmm. sufficient that the student athlete is enrolled and has maintained a minimum GPA or she and and there, thereby we, we satisfy the amateurism test and, and it's enrollment, but we can pay them. That, that's like the bonus question on the exam, you know, because uh, there's, there's student athletes who are paid with no cap, whatever the market bears, as Kavanaugh would say, uh, is that is that the best model uh, going forward? W or would this collapse? If somebody said, would that become minor leagues? I still think Ohio State, somebody from Columbus would sell out every game in that model. I, I, I almost guarantee you, I, I will buy your season tickets if you don't want them, yeah. uh, you, you know, honestly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we're just right about, our, what do we have, 728, Jill? Yeah, so. a couple of uh, very quick questions. I mean, you frame yes. it, um, and with a lot of examples in uh, basketball and football, do you see these issues emerging elsewhere within sports or uh, more so in the men's men's sports than women's, just generally, you know, reflecting on those cohorts that this well, is I, in the Wild West. I worry about the Olympic sports, as they're called, the individual sports. Mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, what could happen? I mean, uh, not all that many schools really make money, believe it or not, after everything's all said and done. I mean, most schools, like the Mid-American Conference, where we live, is is really struggling you know and and the subsidies the rutgers came into the big 12 or you know big 10 and uh you know they, they're having to subsidize that program mightily just to keep it afloat so what would be the counteract oh we're going to get rid of and this happened you know right. stanford got rid of some of its varsity teams well we'll have to cut men's xyz and women's X, abc uh, substantially proportional cuts and we'll make them club sports you know mm -hmm. and and I, I really think the non-income producing sports be they men's or women's are in jeopardy uh, mm -hmm. of being cut because of the expense of, of running these major programs. And, and again, it's the media rights that drives everything that allows them to, to, to possibly make, but then to support all these other varsity sports, even at Ohio State with all that money that comes into Gene Smith as the athletic director, so the monetization of Ohio State's media right, it's still, you know, especially with COVID, did not make money that year because the fans weren't in the seats. Yeah. And w which sports are going to get hurt, cut first? The non-income producing sports, you know. And and but it would have they'd have to cut them in a proportional way, or else you have a title not title nine issue. Right. Well, that's frightening thought. I was a Division One track athlete, and I can't imagine having not had that opportunity. So <laughs> I know would, would a club sport have been sufficient? I mean, that's right. I, I I don't think so. I no. don't. I don't think so. No. So no. let's hope it doesn't come to that. No, yeah. it's, there's no substitute for varsity. If we have time for another clarification, there was uh, one case involving charitable causes. 
Is that elaborated upon in any of the legal precedent? What constitutes there, charitable cause? Yeah, there's there's an entire bylaw we teach it about doing things for charity, which is mm -hmm. like a, a getaway clause, and I think they're hiding behind, yeah. hiding behind that. Yeah, yeah, they're doing doing things for not for profits is like this huge carve out, and you have mm -hmm. to get all sorts of sign offs on it. And I, I think they've got to be hiding behind that the the, the pancake factory. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, I mean, we haven't yet gotten to the point where we're dropping the term student athlete. <laughs> no, we no. Never will. God forbid. Yeah. God forbid. Yeah. Well, you know, with that, um, I welcome any of your last uh, parting words. Anyone who, you know, if you would like to share any final thoughts with our audience, please do. Thank you, Jill. Yes, I would love to. My name is Sol Gerard, everybody. I am the vice president of the board of the Extension School Alumni Association and also the chair for uh, our Midwest chapter. And I really want to thank Professor Carfagna and Aaron. Um, I was actually taking notes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so exciting. Quiz, quiz, quiz to follow, quiz to follow. <laughs> quiz to follow. And I do want to thank, uh, especially of course, our Office of Advancement, Jill, Veronica, Chrissy. Yes. Um, thank you so much for what you do for our school. Um, thank you, Professor, for um, and Aaron for this amazing talk in which you really interface uh, business, law, ethics. I mean, there's so much to think about this topic. And Liz, thank you for making this happen. Um, you are always um, such an amazing volunteer. And I also want to tell everybody that we have two of our board members here as well, Frank Caprino from our engagement committee and uh, Rick Pearl, who is the secretary of our board. So I just want to thank everybody. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah, thank you, so. And with that, uh, Professor Carfagna or Aaron, if you would like to share anything, please do. But I cannot express how grateful we are for your amazing presentation full of information and I have notes myself and a reading list thanks to you so <laughs> thank you. our pleasure and enjoy March Madness and maybe the last time absolutely you can. <laughs> absolutely and I hope not. I hope. yes I hope not go do it best go of luck it. to Celia whose beautiful daughter yes. will be joining yes. Harvard women's basketball and I for one can't wait to see her play uh, just fabulous so with absolutely. that uh, Thank you both. And Our pleasure. have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you for joining thanks, us. And thanks. Thank thanks. So much. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Aaron. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank thanks, thank Nick. You. Great to see you, Nick and Elizabeth. Great to see you. Take thank care. You, good night, Bye -bye. everyone. Good night, everyone.